the last thing you want is the combination at the beginning determines who's going to win. It's like, okay, <laughs> Bob over here just got that combination. Like, there's no reason. Like, what are we doing here? Yeah, so that's it. Let's just pack it in. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of like Candyland. The cards have already determined Bob is going to win. I mean, I know in the video game world, if you look at like um, MOBA games, um, like League of Legends and stuff like that, that d- initial draft of characters is super important. You know, games can be won or lost right there in that initial draft. And then the, the next 45 minutes is just, you know, kind of a foregone conclusion and that's not a great design doesn't make it you know it's it's not what people want to do you got to respect people's time yeah that's a really good one so jeff really excited to have you on the show you're a guy i i've listened to for hours and hours and hours thanks to the ludology podcast back when i was living in honduras i used to work at an orphanage and during the day i had a lot of time to myself where i was kind of like overseeing kids making sure nobody is getting hurt or you know running away or anything but for a long time, I didn't speak Spanish. And so I was like trying to figure out, you know, I couldn't communicate super well and other than like hand motions and like a very small, like kindergarten level you know, version of Spanish. And so I spent a lot of my time listening to podcasts about speaking Spanish, but that you can't do that all the day, all, all the time. And so I found Ludology. And so I would go back and forth between Spanish and Ludology and just picking up game design and design theory. And so when you and Ryan, Ryan Sturm, is that, Sturm, remember that yeah. right? Yeah, like that was my favorite era of the Ludology podcast. And I listened to them all and I listened to a lot of them multiple times. And so, first of all, thank you for putting out so much content because you helped actually get me into podcasting. I listened to so many episodes that y'all did. I was like, I think I want to do this too. I want to do an interview show. And like, I wanted to take it a different angle. But I, I don't know if the Board Game Design Lab podcast would exist if it wasn't for the Ludology podcast. So I really appreciate all the hours and effort you put in to doing that. And um. Yeah, man, I just wanted to say thank you and just kind of publicly make make that known. <laughs> ah, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I also I, I also appreciate you. I were at first place I thought you were going was said, you know, yeah, I used to I, I used to listen to the Logic Podcast back when I was, and I was sure you were gonna go say like when I was like 10 years old. And I was gonna be really <laughs> sad. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't that long ago. So, so just, that, just a few so years. That's, that was not, and that's great. That work that you're doing, working the orphanage in Honduras. That's um, that's fantastic stuff. So, yeah, man, it was it that. was wild, and um, man, we could talk for for days about the kind of all the stuff that goes into that positive, negative, good, bad, and, and whatever. But another thing is, I learned that you have to have an outlet. You have to, if, especially if you have a job that's super intense. And anytime you're working with children all day, every day, obviously that's going to be kind of crazy, but especially when you're working with kids who have been traumatized and abused and have gone through, I mean, just hell and they're seven, you know, so they don't even have the tools to really figure things out. Like it's, it was so difficult. And one of the things that really got me into game design is that I needed an outlet. I needed to escape. I needed to kind of get away from what I was dealing with day in and day out. And I needed to go somewhere else mentally. And game design was a perfect avenue that now I'm thinking about, you know, science fiction or dragons or like whatever the theme is, but then also how do we get these mechanisms to line up and, and I could kind of take my brain somewhere else. And then, and then your podcast was helpful in that too, because I could then kind of like take these things and learn design theory and different ideas about mechanism and all that, and then apply them to what I was doing. And it was was just a hobby for a long, long time. And then it just kind of slowly became more than that. And so anyone listening to this, that if you're going through a hard time, because I know I've talked to designers that they think, is, is game design really worth my time? Like they feel like there's so many issues in the world. There's so many problems. There's so much, so much wrong in the world. And they kind of feel guilty about taking time out of their day to make a, you know, to make a game, to make fun. And I just want to encourage anyone listening to this that has ever felt guilty or felt weird about it. I promise it matters right? Uh, to bring fun into the world is important. And yes, there are any number of, of problems and, and tragedies and crazy things going on in the world that we can put our minds to, but I think game design is is worth it. And so let me ask your, your perspective, Jeff, have, have, have you ever run into a situation where you're like, game design matters? And you can like point to a specific story, a specific person that you've met where you're like, okay, game design or, or gaming in general, like really affected the world in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just first off, uh, you know, two things. So at first, just to kind of take a longer view, you know, I mean, games and play are just so integral to the human experience. It's, you know, anthropologically, it's really kind of considered this separate type of human activity. You know, it's not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not trying to raise food or do basic survival or things like that, but it goes, you know, it's, it's definitely part of every human society and it goes back 
thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, some of the first games were found, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years ago in Egypt. Um, every single civilization that's been, you know, archaeologically explored has had some form of dice or, so, you know, something like that. You know, it's just so bound up in humanity that it's just, you know, it's, it's obviously reflects something deep within us. Um, but I, you know, on a personal level, just, I, I always, you know, it always means a lot to me, you know, when people kind of share their stories, um, you know, particularly, you know, if, if I, I've inspired people and I, I, you know, it, it always, it always kind of shocks me a little bit that you have that impact. Sometimes, you know, you just talk to, to hear yourself talk, but, um, uh, you know, like what you were sharing, but you know, one time I was in, in, in the airport, I was in Newark airport, just waiting for a flight. And I think I was, you know, talking to somebody on the phone. I must, I obviously was talking in some fashion, I guess. And somebody just walks over to me and he's like, excuse me, are you, are, you know, are you Jeff? They knew your voice. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, he says, I, I like your stuff so much. And he says, I just want to tell you that, you know, turn, getting turned on in game design, you know, really, you know, saved my life. I was in a really, really dark place. And, you know, I, I, you know, just a lot of problems, a lot of things going on. And just like what you were saying, you know, this was in a, in escape, but, but more, you know, in, in a purposeful way, right. It's not just, it's still, it engages the brain. I mean, it engages the whole brain, right. It's both art and science and engineering and psychology yeah. and everything else that goes into, you know, thinking about a game and how to design a game. And, you know, he just, you know, expressed to me that, that it was, just a huge turning point in his life to get into, you know, game design and seeing that that was an option that he could pursue, do things like that. So, you know, that was, that was tremendous. Um, and then similarly, I've seen, you know, I, uh, I have a, um, uh, a scholarship program called new voices in gaming where we sponsor, um, uh, people from underrepresented backgrounds to come to various game conventions and design co conferences and stuff like that. And we've had some of our people that it's literally kind of, you know, again, changed their life. They were, you know, in a different type of job, wasn't what they were wanting to doing. They wanted to do this. And, you know, we brought them in, got them, you know, networked them with some people and, you know, did, uh, you know, it's, it's not everybody, but certainly a, a decent percentage, you know, were able to turn it around and make a career and, and change their lives. And that's, you know, it's, it's really gratifying to, to see that. So yeah, I, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, it, it, especially in the United States, you know, board games have been tarred for a long time as like this, this kid stuff, play things, not serious, you know, adults won't, shouldn't do it. And, you know, I, I really don't think that that's uh, fair or, or true or true to the history of humanity. Well, I mean, especially if you just take a step back and you look at just games in general, Right. So video games, I saw this other day, if I'm, if I remember right, video games make more money than movies and TV combined. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, that's, that's interesting. People don't realize, you know, video, video game industry dwarfs Hollywood. Right. And it's, you know, and yet people are so obsessed with, way more obsessed with Hollywood and all that stuff that happens and things like that over the video games. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then you think about American football, you think about Major League Baseball, you think about the NBA I mean, we're talking bazillions of dollars. And now all this uh, gambling stuff is in there too. And where gambling just becoming more, more and more mainstream for better and for worse, right? Well, that's that's a game, right? All of a sudden, it, we're gamifying these things. Uh, fantasy sports, you know, fantasy football is one of the most popular things in the world as far as the American world. Like games are just everywhere constantly. And humans, going back to what you are saying a moment ago throughout history, like we create games just that's just what we do. Like we are natural game creators. If you look at kids playing on a playground, they default down. Like the lowest common denominator is, hey, let's play a game. And then they'll just invent it on the fly. And the rules are absurd and everybody's cheating. And <laughs> it's kind of wild out there. It's the wild west of that game. But it's still a game. And there's so many interesting, like psychological, theoretical things on the background. And that's why I'm, man, I'm just so excited to chat with you. You've been on the list for a long, long time to bring on the show and just chat about like, design theory. I think, I think Tom Vassell has probably played more board games than anyone else on the planet, but I think you have talked about more design, like game design theory topics than anyone else on the planet. And so it was kind of cool that y'all were working together on the Dice Hour podcast for forever, kind of with our powers combined. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just excited to chat about some very interesting topics. But before we get into those specifically, what's a good like working definition of design theory? Like what exactly does that mean? Because I feel like it's kind of, it's, could be very, very broad, but in your mind, what is design theory? So for me, it's, um, 
it's it's a way to kind of generate tools or, or rules of thumb when doing design. You know, when you're when you're sitting down to design a game, um, there's you know, there's a blank piece of paper, right? There's a zillion different ways that you can go. There's, there's different, there's so many different decisions that you have to make, right? And um, you're, you're trying to get to the best game you can possibly make. And, you know, you can know absolutely nothing about games and you can end up ult- eventually, you know, making a game that's really good. You know, there's, there's nothing says that, that you have to have design theory or rules or anything to, you know, rules of thumb, et cetera, to, to make a great game. You can just totally go through there and get there. But, if you, you know, kind of study games and you understand that there's, you know, hard won lessons from of so many different disciplines, like we just, you know, talked about how games are at the intersection of so many different aspects of, of, uh, human functions that, um, knowing some of these rules and knowing what makes things tick is going to put you in a better position to make a good game faster or, or make a better game in general. You know, if I'm studying film, Right. If, or if I'm writing a play, I can, I, I don't, I have never, maybe I never saw a play and maybe I'll sit down and I'll write a play and it's going to be the f- most fantastic play ever or the best movie ever. And it'll, you know, break new ground. And just because I'm coming at it from, from, from a, from a blank page, but most likely it's not, most likely it's going to be not so great. And same thing when you're designing a game, right? If you're designing a game, maybe you'll get lucky and you'll do something great. But, you know, if you know, you know, like in a film, if you know the types of shots that there are, you know, the type of pacing, you know how to do it, you study edits and you study cuts and you study angles and you study lighting and you study cinematography and use of color and music, you know, there's all these different things that you study. Then when you actually go to make a movie, it's, it's not going to be a guarantee of success, but it's going to give you a, a leg up. And I think it's the same thing with game design theory is, you know, here's, Here's the types of mechanisms that have worked or don't work. Here's the types of psychology that players bring. Here's some probability, you know, that you can use to bring to it. You know, you don't need to know probability to design a game, but it's going to be a lot faster if I can sit down and figure out on average, how many turns is this game going to last if I do this? Or how often is someone going to get messed up when they draw their starting hand and it doesn't include this one type of card? I'll get there through playtesting, but it's just a tool that you can use to shortcut things and to put yourself on the better track. So that's that's kind of what I see as the role of design theory. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's the why of games, right? right? The right. behind the scenes that oh, you don't have to know. And how it's, it reminds me of our, go ahead. that was our that was our tagline. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It actually reminds me of my wife. So she moved to Honduras when she was nineteen. And we ended up meeting, I had to go to Honduras to meet a girl from Alabama. It's kind of funny how that works out. I'm you know, being from Alabama, but she moved to Honduras and didn't know very much Spanish. And then while living there, immersed in that culture, she picked up on the language and she could speak it fluently and her accent, her Alabama accent disappeared. She picked up on the Honduran accent to the point where if you were talking to her on the phone, you would assume this is a person that was born in Honduras. Like she was so incredibly fluent, but she could not tell you why about hardly any of it. So if you were like, why do you conjugate a verb like this? She would say, because that's how they, that, that, that's just what they do. Like that's, that's just how we speak here. So she ended up going to language school after she was fluent to understand the why of all the things that she already knew. And so she's sitting in these classes. She knows she can ace every test, but she like, when it comes to like conversation, but if you said, okay, conjugate this verb, she'd be like, I have no idea. (laughs) Well, I don't, I don't know. And so Again, it's it's not necessary to know all the design theory, but like you said, it's tools in your tool belt that you can then step back and, and understand the deeper things that are going on to speed the process up, to make a game better, to understand why something is broken. That was my issue for a long time. I would run into design challenges. I, I, don't, I don't know why this doesn't work. Well, it's because I didn't fully understand probability or whatever else was going on with, with the game. And so I think it's just important to learn uh, as you go and, and get better. So let's chat about some of your favorite design theory topics. And some of these, I think all of these actually are just wildly interesting, somewhat entertaining and kind of funny the way they all work out. But let's start off with the, the shuffled decks. So, or card decks. So like, apparently if I shuffle a deck that is probably different than any other shuffled deck ever. Is that the case? Like, like there's never been the same deck shuffled twice. Like how do we understand this? (laughs) Yeah. So, um, uh, one time I was, I was reading, um, 
you know, I, I, I was reading an article and somebody was saying, you know, just, just mentioned in passing, oh, if you, you shuffle a deck of cards, you're probably the only person who's held that specific configuration of a deck. And me, because I'm a crazy person, I'm like, huh. I said, I wonder exactly how probable it is that that's really the case. Um, and so I went and I, you know, I, I went to sat down and I did some math and, you know, I, so I started with the number of different ways a deck can be arranged deck of cards, 52 cards. Um, I probably should bring up the number, but it's a really, 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 really big number. And I'll come back to that in a second, but it's like, you know, 10 to the 37th or something. It's, it's just an insanely large number. Um, and then I said, well, how, how do we know how many times, you know, a deck has been shuffled. So I was like, well, just, you know, what the heck, just, let's just say that every, st the deck of cards was invented around 1400. So how many people in the world have lived from 1400 until now? And let's assume that every single one of those people has shuffled a deck of cards one time every day. Maybe it's high, you know, they're already high starting, for some people, starting something. with their kind of preposterous. Right. Well, yeah. so it's something, right? It gets you somewhere, right? Yeah. And so I, I went right. through all the calculations and it turned out that the chances of, you know, that if you have a shuffle deck of cards, that somebody else has, has, has had that same shuffle deck was like 0. 0.000000 with like 27 zeros and then one or something like that, right? I mean, it was incredibly small. Uh, and this, of course, is assuming that it's a right re regular shuffle and stuff like that. But it just, you know, it just for me, it put into perspective how, you know, the, the and again, this is just 52 cards, right? You know, and if you compare with like other random things, like, you know, a, a, a pot of water, I mean, how many molecules are there in, you know, a pot of water that's, you know, moving around and stuff like that, it makes you think about quantum mechanics and, and the, the fact that that's random, but things don't act randomly. Well, it's just because there's so much of it that it's just on average, it's going to be what it is. But with just 52 cards, I can create so many different starting conditions for players to have to deal with, or for anybody to have to deal with that it's, it's in essence, it's unique, right? Every single game is basically going to be unique with a given set of cards, depending on the game. But, um, and I, I've really kind of leaned into that principle, particularly lately with um, uh, with some of my designs, is the idea that you can take a small number, smallish number of things to create a much larger number of conditions. Um, so, you know, for example, I've got a, a new game coming out that I do with David Thompson called uh, Chang'e, which is about the voyages of... Um, Chinese treasure fleets in the 1400s, which were led by the Admiral Chang'e, um, which ironically, I guess, was right around the time when the deck of cards was invented in Western, uh, in, in Europe. But, um, uh, you know, he's sailing around, the fleet sailing around and visiting different ports in the Indian Ocean. And we wanted there to kind of be different things in the ports. So when you sail into a port, you flip a card and it kind of tells you about the port. Well, originally we were just making cards for the ports and it was... Um, we're like, we, we weren't making, it was getting too repetitious. We didn't have enough cards for the port. So I'm like, let's use the power of combinatorics to expand on that. Right. So basically we we now have two decks. We've got a leader and we've got a port condition card. I think it's actually called an encounter card. And when you sail into port, now you flip one card from your leader deck and one card from the encounter deck. And those two things combine. So now instead of 30, 40, or 50 different possibilities from a deck of cards, now I've got two decks of 30. So now I've got 900 different possible combinations all of a sudden, right? Without doing that much more work. Um, and it also becomes very evocative. So now I've got, you know, I've got the the stingy leader in the port that's having a, you know, a, um, a, a drought you know, and it creates situations that now I can, I can kind of build up those situations in my head. Um, and it's similar to like, I guess like small world does that, right? So small world has the two different combinations of things. So, you know, I, I, I've been really enjoying that as a design technique of this idea of taking, you know, small groups of things and combining them in different ways to give the players really big experience without a lot of investment in, in design time or in component count, which of course is always important to try, you know, you, 
Uh, there are certainly some games that come with 900 cards that you got to, you know, shuffle through and go through to get uniqueness, but you don't have to do that. And it's going to, your publisher's going to be a lot happier when they only have to make 60 cards. Yeah, no doubt. So a lot lower art costs yes. in that case. Uh, another thing, another thing you're tapping into with that is this element of surprise, right? If I know that there's only, let's say 10 possibilities that I, there's only 10 cards I could flip over. Okay. There's a certain amount of surprise, but like there's only 10 cards versus, you know, two decks of 10. So now there's a hundred possibilities of these combinations. That's more surprise, right? There's more possibilities that it could be, you know, and now it's kind of interesting. Like I might be hoping for a certain combo, a certain set or something close, right? Uh, you know, it could be one of these 10 combos that will really be beneficial to me. And then there's that element of, the, it's almost like that tension, right? And I feel like games that really lean into that surprise element in a good way, right? That's It's still, it's not like endless. It's not like, a zillion different right. possibilities. Like, no, there's it's still a bounded. certain number yeah. of possibilities. And and you got to make exactly. sure that they're different uh, enough so that, in. you know, card A with card B is a different enough than card C with card B, you know, that you still, you know, that that it feels different. So you, you got to work on that. But yeah, it's, it's a very powerful technique um, that, you know, certainly there's tons of games that use it, but I, I still see when I, when I evaluate designs and talk to designers, it's still it's not always at the top of people's minds of something that they can do to add more variety to a game of just, like you said, or just take that same deck of 10 cards and split it into two decks of five, you know, and you go from 10 to 25, you know, without, you know, boom, doing anything. Yeah. It's a really good, really good point on the, on, I don't know if downside is the right word, but anyway, on the other side of that, well, now there's also a little more playtesting to be involved, right? It's like small world. I can't imagine how many playtests had to happen with small world <laughs> to make sure that one right. combination yeah. wasn't just like, the killer of the game. So that is something to think about. Any, any advice there as far as like play testing and, and figuring out overpowered versus underpowered combinations. And maybe sometimes it just doesn't even matter. Like the cards come out and the cards come out like this is you, now this is a new game state and the players just have to deal with this combination as it is, which is kind of interesting. But what would you say as far as, you know, I, I, there's definitely ways to deal with that. Um, you know, small world deals with it by having sort of a mini auction basically you get those. So if you really value mm -hmm. something, you can dig deep True. down to try to get it. And if somebody, you know, goes all the way, skips over a whole bunch of stuff to get down to it, you know, good on them. And that's also going to give me a little bonus because I'm going to get some extra coins when I take somebody else. Um, another way is just to e either have the choice not be dominant in the play or, or just have it, um, you know, enough other randomness. And I actually thought about this, but we're, we just did a new game. Um, one uh, my early designs were all with my kids. Um, and now, um, you know, my, my son's off working, my daughter's off in, uh, she's works now for indie game studios, um, and, and does, uh, designs for them. So I've kind of lost my play testers, but, but we, we actually had the opportunity to design a game together, um, for, uh, uh, for WizKids, which is going to be coming announced soon. So I can't talk about it too much, but it's super exciting. Uh, and, um, you know, we leaned heavily into the combinator. So basically it's, you know, you get characters and, um, you know, initially our initial design was like, well, you know, you just get a character on, on your, your team and you're trying to do something with it, you know? And then we're like, well, let's just give them two, just draw two. And it just, it just totally opened up the design because there's so many more combinations and you have to kind of put those combos together and decide who's going to work well together and stuff like that. Um, but even so there's enough randomness in the system and there's enough, you know, there's three separate phases of the game and you have to have a different combo in each phase. So even if you dominate in one, you know, you may not do as well in the other. So we found that it kind of balances out, but yeah, it's, it certainly makes the testing. You got to look for those kind of killer combos. And there's always been games that, you know, sometimes there's games that come out that have infinite loops or just, you know, they got to be retroactively <laughs> nerfed or whatever. So. Right. And that's, that's a really good way to look at it. And something to think about small world does that too. You're not going to just have one combination for the entire game. You're going to have two, three, maybe four, you know, depending on how the game turns out. And so, you know, a combination that really helps you early, you're probably not going to have it at all middle or late. And so I think that's another way that, you know, a designer can, can balance the game out where, because last thing you want is the combination at the beginning determines who's going to win. It's like, okay, <laughs> Bob over here just yeah, got that so combination. It. Like Let's there's no reason. It in. Like, what are we doing sure. here? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Kind of like Candyland. The, uh, the cards yeah, have already and, determined. And there's game, Bob I mean, is and going there to are win. games sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, I know in the video game world, if you look at like, um, uh, you know, MOBA games, um, like League of Legends and stuff like that, that initial draft of characters is super important. And, you know, games can be won or lost right there in that initial draft. And then the, the next 45 minutes is just, you know, 
kind of a foregone conclusion. And that's not a great design. It doesn't make it, it you know, it's, it's not what people want to do. You got to respect people's time. Yeah. That's a really good one. Okay. So that's, that's cool. Let's move on to a, a interesting, I didn't know anything about this. I never had a colonoscopy. So I, you know, <laughs> I, not, not something not, I was, not of that age yet. Huh? No, no, not quite getting there, getting there, getting close, not super excited about it, but, um, Let's talk about colonoscopies and memory and how that applies to game design. Because I was reading the the game tech that you wrote for this. Super interesting, right? Especially thinking about like in-game, like how things play out as the game, you know, comes to a close. So tell folks like the general idea and then let's dive into the theory behind it. Yeah, I, I love this story. So um, back in the, the 90s, I believe it was, they did a, a study of... Um, people that were having colonoscopies um, and the level of discomfort that they experienced during the colonoscopy. Um, so what they did is they basically, um, they, they asked people like every minute to rate their discomfort level on a scale of, you know, one to 10 or whatever it was. And then they went through um, and they did, but they did two different groups of people. So one, they, they had the full colonoscopy and the colonoscopy right at the very end of it is, was the most uncomfortable time. Always. It kind of ended, you know, ended and and at the very end, it was very uncomfortable. Um, By the way, I will briefly interrupt this story to say colonoscopies now are very different than they were in the eighties or nineties. I've had a colonoscopy. It was the best sleep of my life. (laughs) It was wonderful. I woke up like super happy and excited. So it is not, don't, don't worry about what, you know, it's not done the same way. I got four young kids. So what you're saying is I need to go get a colonoscopy. Like that might be the best night of sleep I've had. Uh, you know, yeah. Cause the, you know, you got to get there early. They, you know, you just kind of relax and hang out and they give you some nice, uh, nice medications. They supervise you. So you're all good. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Um, anyway, once a week you're saying I need to go do this once a week. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm not going to get involved in your personal life. Man. I don't need to do what you want to do, but, um, It's, um, anyway, so in the first one, the first group of people, they went through the whole colonoscopy, like say 20 minutes. I remember the exact time. So it was like a 20 minute procedure. 20 minutes was kind of the peak discomfort level. And then they had 10 minutes after that, where they let the people kind of relax and unwind a little bit. And then, but they didn't tell, you know, they didn't tell them the procedure was over. They just kind of had it going a little bit or whatever. And then at 10 minutes, they, they stopped it. So a 30 minute procedure, the, the second group of people, they stopped the procedure right at that point of maximum discomfort. And it was, but it was 20 minutes long. So again, the first group, they was 30 minutes long. Um, and the, the second group was 20 minutes long, but and they were going to look at it and say, well, they both had the same peak discomfort, you know, but, and, and this other one was longer. So they, their initial assumption was the people that sat through the longer procedure would be less happy overall. And then, then the, um, then the first group were just, you know, yeah, it was 20, it was only 20 minutes. So it was a shorter procedure. Um, but what they found out when they went and they interviewed people later and they asked them to kind of rate the experience that the people that had the longer experience were much more favorable about the, um, uh, about the overall experience and, and their when asked to rate their, over, their discomfort, you know, whether I guess not whether they would do it again, but just in general, the rating of the discomfort was people that ended on a bad note were, were much less happy with the procedure, even though it was shorter, even though it was, it, they, they were, they were uncomfortable for a much shorter period of time. They still overall rated it as a, as a less uh, pleasant experience um, than the first group. And they did this kind of study on some other different things. And ultimately they came up with a, a the best way to fit the data. Cause first, if you kind of picture a graph, I don't know if you can see me, I, those who can't see me, I'm just making a graph of like a peak and then decline. So their first theory was that the total unhappiness that people would have with their procedure was the area under the curve, right? So the fact that it was a longer curve and at the same peak, there was more discomfort under that curve. Those people would be less happy. When they did all these other experiments, they found out that the best fit to the data was what they called the peak end the peak end uh, theory, which is that you basically average 
the 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 peak discomfort that you felt at any point and the ending value of this discomfort that you felt when it right when it ended and so the first group that had the longer procedure they had the same peak but they had a much better ending point whereas the second group the peak and the end coincided and so it was much uh, rated much worse even though the the time doesn't factor into it at all um and so when you're looking at you know and and you know when you, and the flip side is true also on the good side you know when you have a positive experience um it, it's the the best moment and also the ending so ideally the peak end theory tells us if you're designing a game or making a book or a movie or whatever right you want the best moment in the game to occur right at the end of the game so you know i've played many games where there's exciting moments but then it goes on and it kind of ends with a whimper and you don't you know and i think intuitively people think oh yeah i'm not going to i'm not going to be as happy as if a game that has that exciting moment and that's when the game ends right those are the moments when you get that final stand up die roll or it's a big thing you're making the last attack i mean we all have those stories right remember those moments so so when you're designing you want to make sure that you end at a you know a very exciting moment win or lose you want to try to do that for people to remember it um and it was interesting because i was reading that right when i we were we were in the middle of the design of of space cadets which was the second game that that we published um, which is a cooperative game of flying a starship and um, trying to accomplish missions. And at that time, uh, when I first read that, the the way you you won the mission, um, you know, you would win the mission by you know whatever the mission criteria were, and you know, shooting or something. But when you lost the mission, um, you uh, uh, you you just took damage, and sometimes the damage might hit your core or something like that. But it wasn't, I mean, the enemies just rolled the dice and if they hit you, they hit you and you died. Wasn't much you could do about it. Um, and even though there was a lot of really fun and exciting moments through the game, we realized, hey, you know, we've got this peak end problem. <laughs> the game always tended to end on sort of a, a bummer note. Either way, even you know when the mission was successful or, went, or the other way. And so we kind of went back and we retooled and we added two new mechanics to it. Um, on the good side, in order to finish the mission, you had to you had to jump out of the the sector. So when you accomplish the mission goals, you still had to charge up the jump drives and and hyperdrive out. And in order to do that, you had to do this little mini game. The whole thing with Space Cadets is under time pressure. Everything is done under these thirty second little things. So you had to basically to jump out. You had to get a Yahtzee, and during the mission, you could earn cards that would let you manipulate the dice during the 30 seconds. So you basically had to roll the dice and then use these cards to solve this little puzzle. Like, how do I get this to be all fives or all twos or whatever? And it was exciting because the whole team's clustered around the, the jump drive officer that's doing it. There's 30 seconds on the clock. You're trying to figure out how to use these cards. Everybody's yelling and screaming. And when you do it, it's very exciting. And if you don't do it, you know, you got to survive another turn. The enemies are still shooting at you and you got to try to jump the next turn. Uh, and you, if, even if you fail, you usually earn a little bonus card uh, to, that'll help you next time. And then on the negative side, we had it so that when your core was hit, instead of the ship just blowing up, that the next round you had a chance to rep repair the breach. There was a whole core breach minigame that you had to go through. And in that case, in, in it, it was a very simple mini game. You basically had a deck of cards and you dealt up a certain, there were two decks that matched with shapes and you dealt up a certain number of shapes. Everyone got a shape and you just had to shuffle through this deck of cards, find the shape that you had and then pass it to your teammate. And you had to find a certain number of shapes in the deck before 30 seconds were up. But it happened at the same time as you're doing all the other jobs. You're also trying to steer the ship and put up the shields and do, do load the torpedo tubes and do everything else you're trying to do. Um, to succeed in the mission while fixing the core breach. Um, and so even when you lose, even when you don't successfully seal up the breach, it was frantic and exciting and dramatic and people just loved it. Even in losing, people loved it. And so, you know, it was one of these things you talked about, like the purpose of design. It's like, I read this study and I was like immediately able to take it and make my game like 10 times better. And it had plenty of other issues, believe me. If I was going to redesign that now, I would make it a lot simpler. There's other things. It's like every other, you know, early game designer-itis is it was too complicated for its own good. 
but the, I was very, very proud. We were all very, very proud of those le- those end game mechanisms, both on the good and the bad side, to specifically bring out that excitement, bring out that climax right at the end. Yeah, definitely. And this kind of taps into my own personal feelings. Like the games that I love the most are the ones that have a win condition more so than a, okay, now we're going to count up points and see who has the most victory points and then they win. Like, I love that moment of somebody wins the game. Like now it's over, you know, not, oh, we got to the 12th round and this the end and now we got to count up. Like, no, I just, I want to cross the finish line first or I want to blow you up or you blow me up and like a very definitive moment that now the game is over and there's a winner. And even in sports, I don't know if there's anything more exciting in sports than a walk-off moment right? Bottom of the ninth, you're down by a run and you, you hit a two run home run to and win the game. And that's why I love it's overtime over. like, playoff Yeah, it doesn't matter if there's the best. Yeah. I mean, football, you can kind of yes. see it coming. You can see them marching down the field or getting in field goal range or whatever. But yeah, hockey is just like boom, 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 up and down the ice constantly. It's yeah. <laughs> and now it's over. Like all of a sudden yeah. somebody hit the crap out of that puck and it hit the net and now we're done, you know? And yeah, football is like, it, it football is a little more methodical and you know, messing with the clock and stuff like that. But when you do have those moments, that Hail Mary moment where there's no time left, or even this past weekend, Notre Dame playing Ohio State, Ohio State had one play and either they score and win or they don't and they lose. Like it's the last play. There's nothing else that's going to happen. And they crossed the goal line, just barely got it in. Yeah, I over. love sports. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I'm not a huge sports fan, but I love the concept of like the rules in sports and what goes on with that. that. I mean, that was talking about endings. I mean, there was the, basketball has been experimenting with this Elam ending, which I talked about in one game tech. I don't know if you know that. Yes, it's so much better. Yeah, where you you have to have a game winning shot. It's so much better. I mean, I like basketball generally, except for the like the last three minutes of the game is terrible. Everybody's fouling each other. It, yeah, the last the last three minutes take twenty minutes to play. It's like, guys, could, yeah, no, I love this new one. Where remind me, it's, it's they add a certain number of points. So the way it works is, yeah, there's a certain time at a certain time of the like with five minutes left in the game or whatever. There's a certain time period just based on the clock, and so at five minutes left in the fourth quarter they actually just turn off the shot clock and they take, they take the person's, the team who's got the higher score, uh, you know, let's say it's 77 to 75. They add 20 points or 25 points or whatever. They add say 20 points, they add 20 points to the leading team score. And that becomes the target. So the target is now 97, right? If the, if the other team had 70, if leading team had 77. And then the first team to get to 97 wins the game. That's it. There's no more clock. It, it's shut off. It's done. Yeah. So now, yeah, you could foul somebody, you know, but you're giving up points, right? right. And you can have a walk off free throw. <laughs> always, the game, right. The game always ends on a, on a walk off shot, right? It game, you know, if somebody, you know, if it's 95, 94, you know, it's again, it's sudden death, you know, it's good. If somebody hits a three pointer or whatever, you know, it's gonna, so it's, I, I think, think it's a, it's a brilliant, um, rules based solution to try to solve that end game problem in basketball. Yeah, maybe not for middle school basketball because the game will never end. Because those kids, <laughs> they shoot like 12%. It's just next basket. If anybody <laughs> just scores any points at all, we'll go home, please. Right. But definitely for the professional, even the like high end college level, it's exciting, right? And you don't, you, you're not, you're probably not going to leave the stands. Like, even if your team is down, like there's still a yeah, chance. There's always a chance, right? Yeah. I mean, you get to these points in, you know, you don't want it to be hopeless, right? So you, you get to, you know, you can get to a point in a basketball game or a football game where you just, you can't possibly come back. I mean, baseball, you can always come back, um, you know, but uh, yeah, I, so I'm curious. They've used it in the All-Star game, I think, and they've done it in a couple of different tournaments and things like that. So maybe it'll start getting wider adoption. Yeah, that's where I first saw it was the NBA All-Star game two or three years ago. And yeah. I was immediately trying to figure out why don't y'all just do this all the time? I don't understand. Like this is such a better way to play, but we'll see. Maybe it'll come eventually. Yes. You know, it's one of those things. It's a slow, slow change probably. Okay. So a lot of that has to also do with perception versus reality. Going back to the whole colonoscopy memory kind of thing. Like the people that had the longer procedure, like you could look at a reality standpoint and go, well, that's obviously worse because you were in this uncomfortable state for longer. But then the people that had a shorter one, they had the, you know, they, they would rank it overall as being a worse experience. So I think that's another thing to, to realize. If when you're dealing with players, you're not dealing with rational people. You're, <laughs> you're dealing with humans, you know? And so our perception 
is a lot of times more important than reality, especially when it comes to these topics, right? And it's just something to be aware of. Even if you have a wonderful game that has a really crappy last two minutes, that's what people are going to remember. And so how do you fix that last two? Right. Yeah. It's the experiencing. Yeah. I, I distinguish between the experiencing self and the remembering self, right? And, and honestly, the remembering self is the one that rates your games and decides whether it's refers gonna, it to a friend, posts about again. it on Instagram. The experiencing self is, yeah. is not <laughs> right. So if somebody's telling stories about your game afterwards and stuff like that, you know, I mean, that's, that's great. That's what you want. You want the remembering self to have had a good experience. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay. The next one, let's talk about loss aversion. This is something I talk about a good bit on the podcast. And a lot of what I, what I know is actually from the book you wrote about this topic several years ago, and I read it many moons ago. I need to go back and kind of read it again and refresh. But this idea that people hate to lose more than they like to win, like the feeling of losing is a stronger feeling than the feeling of winning. And anytime you have a situation where someone is going to have to give up something versus gain something, it's not the same, like that. those feelings aren't balanced. Right. And so, you know, understanding that as far as a game, but tell me, let's go deeper. Tell me kind of your bigger picture, maybe even the like synopsis of the book, <laughs> right. The kind of general summary. And then let's like dive into the game design theory parts. Yeah. I love loss aversion. That's, um, it's such a deep topic and yeah, I could talk for forever about, it. like I said, I wrote an entire book about it and, and its application to game theory. But yeah, the, the basic idea is that, like you said, if you, let's say you, if you gain $20, Somebody gives you $20, you feel good. If you lose $20, you feel bad. Okay, that's obvious. But um, but if you the magnitude of the of the of the uh experience is different, right? You you gain $20, you feel good, but if you lose $20, you feel worse than you would feel good. If you can take like the absolute value or the magnitude of the emotion, the 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 negative looms larger in people's minds. Um, so, you know, as an example, um, you know, they, they, they kind of uncover this by doing experiments. Like they would ask people, you know, would you rather get, have a hundred percent chance to get $300 to win $300 or an 80% chance to win $400. And most people take the $300, hundred percent than the 80%, $400 mathematically, you should take the the eighty percent the eighty percent chance with four hundred dollars on average nets you three hundred and twenty dollars. So from an expectation value standpoint, you're better off doing that. But most people won't. And if you flip it around to a loss, like I will tell you, you're going to have to you're going to have a hundred percent chance of losing three hundred dollars, or you're going to have an eighty percent chance of losing four hundred dollars. Most people will choose the uh, the chance of losing the four hundred, or versus the twenty percent chance of not losing anything. Um, and, um, so that's, you know, just kind of one of these general rules is that people will take a sure gain over an uncertain gain, but people will gamble to avoid a sure loss. So, so that's kind of the general rule in a huh. nutshell. And that it, it, from that core psychological conceit concept, uh, you know, which under, under lies, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a, just a huge number of different effects that can, that come out of that. And I explore a lot of them in the book. Um, so, and, and there's, and there's a tremendous applicability to, um, uh, to, to players and the way that you can work with their, their emotions. I mean, one of the things that when you're a game designer, right, if, if I keep going back to movies and books and stuff, I, I love like trying to compare games to other types of media, even a video game. Right. But if I, if I'm making a movie, I've got a lot of tools at my disposal to control the emotion of the viewer. I've got dialogue. I've got the, the angle of the shots. I've got lighting. I've got music, right? I've got all that stuff. I've even got that kind of in some video games to a certain extent. I can do that. Uh, in a book, I have total control over that. Um, in a game, you don't have as much control over the player's emotional state because it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a, it's a sandboxy situation in the first place. You don't know, you know, you, you by definition, things are kind of more open-ended and you don't know the situation you're creating for the players. Um, you're also, um, you know, it's usually in a brightly lit room and, you know, you don't have any control over the atmosphere. Players in a board game tend to have some distance, more distance from the game than they do in a video game because they have to 
keep managing the rules in a way and you know the process just the the bookkeeping and the maintenance of you know draw okay draw the cards and discard now we move this token up here for the next turn and whatever right so all of that stuff kind of creates a distance and makes it very difficult for a game designer to to influence the emotional state of the players loss aversion is one of those few things that you can do that will give you those tools to emotionally manipulate the players both you know either positive emotion or negative emotion and i'm not saying that it's good or bad to do that um, sometimes you want the players to be anxious sometimes you want to design it in such a way that it's not going to make the players anxious right so it all depends on the effect you're, that you're going for and and loss aversion gives you a lot of tools to to try to do that yeah one one thing as you're talking it reminded me the video game metroid handles this in a very interesting way where if I remember right, a lot of times in these different Metroid games, you start the game full, fully powered. You've got all the abilities, you have all the weapons, you have all the cool stuff, and then you play the game for a certain number of minutes, and then something happens, and you lose all of it, and now you're back, you're, you're down to nothing. You've got your little pea shooter, you know, laser gun, and then you have to go throughout the rest of the game is finding all the stuff. You're finding the armor and the weapons and all the abilities, and you're, you're kind of rebuilding what you had in the first 10 minutes of play. Yeah. And so I was thinking through like, could you do that somehow in a board game where you kind of give a player all the fun, you know, interesting things going on and then something happens in round two, phase two, that's all gone. And now you're trying to like rebuild. So you're, you're almost just manipulating that loss aversion feeling in somebody in some way. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I've, I've never actually seen that. And I haven't, I never played Metroid. I was a little, I, a lot of those video games in that realm, like hit me, like right when I was having kids and we weren't playing video <laughs> games, but that's pretty cool. I mean, I like that both from a narrative device as well as an emotional characteristic. I mean, usually they force you to face like the super bad guy and you get your butt kicked early on. And then you got to come back later when you're stronger and, and defeat them. Um, but I, I haven't seen it like that where you give the player a lot of stuff. I know that in general, players get very, very agitated. The, the worst thing, and I'm not saying that this is not a good design technique. I'm just saying from a player's perspective, one of the worst things you can do is give players something and take it away from them. Hmm. Um, the, the example, I, one of the examples I use in the book for this is, um, you know, D and D was first came out, uh, back when I played it. Uh, it was you know back good times in the 70s and 80s back when i was in high school um undead creatures liches and stuff like that uh drained you of a could drain you of a level yes right yeah and that i've hurts. gone back and, and read some stuff and there's nothing that freaked players out more than the prospect of being drained a level um and even same thing in like there was this game wizardry which is one of the older video game rpgs going way back and there was this one creature i still remember it's called murphy's ghost and it was only one area of the a whole game but if you face murphy's ghost or i think vampires could do it too but they would drain you they could actually drain you of levels and it was just like the worst it was just like ugh. And so it's that same idea of pulling it away. And and D and D interestingly has kind of softened that over the years, right? So the first edition, so first couple editions of D and D, there was level draining, just straight up. That was it. Then in third edition, they added a saving throw. You could you could save against the drain, um, and uh, that was in there for a little while. But then in fourth edition, they just took out level draining completely. And in fact, even Pathfinder, which was based off of D and D three point five. Also, even though they kept all basically all the rules intact from D and D three point five, they did take out level training. That was like the only thing that they took out. But I, I've, I include some quotes in the book, but I found like tons of quotes from people online, you know, just basically saying like, you know, I, I hate it worse worse than death. I wish my character had died rather than yeah. go from you know twelfth level to eleventh level or whatever, because you know you're taking toys away from your players, right. And there's so there's so many games that came out, video games, kind of in the last five, 10 years that are the levels are these massive puzzle spaces, basically. And you have to figure out how to get your character from the beginning to the end. But then the levels aren't necessarily built left to right. They're, they're built left to right, up, back left, up, back right. And so if you make a small mistake, you could literally fall from the finish, basically right at the finish line all the way back down to the start. And you could, you could lose hours. You know, you might've, it might've taken you five hours to get where you were. And now you're back at the beginning. And I saw a video. It was, it was like a compilation of the, the 
angriest moments. Like that these streamers that are playing these games or I'm playing them on street on Twitch and just the, the rage and anger and sadness and depression, like all the human emotions wrapped into one from these players over a video game. But it's just that, that moment of loss where they feel like the last five hours was just a giant waste of time. Now it wasn't a waste of time because they had people watching them and donating and subscribing. Like it was a, it's a business move, right? These, these Twitch streamers, this is their job, right? This is their eight hour shift. But the feeling of loss <laughs> overcame any anything else involved. And it was just so interesting and kind of hilarious to watch these people in this video. And so, you know, with those games, I guess that's the point. The stakes are so high. Like that gives you that tension where you know one wrong move and you're going to lose all your progress. And that's kind of the point of the game, right? And then you, when you finally beat it, you get that elation, you get that that moment of epiphany. And that's, and you know, as a game designer, maybe that's what you're trying to do, right? That's the emotion, that's the experience that you want. But a lot of times, I've played games that are, you know, just supposed to be basic kid games or whatever, and they still have those elements in there, and it's not, you know, it's not intentional. It's just arbitrary. It's not, yeah. It's just, a, it's just like, yeah. The designer just didn't really think it yeah. through, and you know, they just create these moments. I mean, even, and, and even kids' games will do it. Like, look at shoots and ladders, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you go all the way back, right? Yeah, <laughs> just fun for everybody else, except for the player that it happens. Yeah, to. or these games where you have to lose cards. These take that games where they're taking, but I guess as long as everybody understands, you sit down at the table. This is the game. Okay, that makes sense, and it's a short game. Whatever, it, it's fine. But the games that there's like one take that element. And, and that's it. And you're sitting there. It's almost like a Euro game. You're just like, everything's very thinky and deterministic. And then all of a sudden a, an event pops up and you lose all your cards. And you're like, what, what? Like, it just doesn't even fit. You know, it's like, why, why? <laughs> right. And so I think that's nothing just to think about being intentional. Yeah. Or my favorite thing, which is the games that make you like swap hands yeah. with another player, right. which I see repeatedly in games. And, and, and the designer is always like, oh, isn't that so wacky? <laughs> It's like, it's wacky, but it's not, you know, nobody wants that. (laughs) Nobody ever wants that. Everyone's got their own plans. They're looking at their cards. They're working things out, you know, and then all of a sudden they've got something completely different. Yeah. I remember this is a random story. I remember when I was in youth group, when I was a kid, we were, we were doing this, we had this like road rules kind of trip. We're going all these different places, doing these challenges, having fun, you know, earning points. The points didn't matter. Anyway, it's just kind of a fun thing. And there was one challenge where they gave us all of these dessert ingredients, right? Vanilla ice cream and chocolate and all this stuff. And then they gave us all of these um, other ingredients like spicy peppers and like random stuff that you would never put on ice cream. Okay. And they said, you're going to make, you're make make an ice cream sundae. Right. And then the, the premise was that you're going to make it for someone else to have to eat it. And so you're making like the worst concoction, this terrible, awful, like crazy thing. Right. And the group of kids I was with, we started looking at each other. We're like, I bet you they're gaming us. I bet you they're messing with us. I bet you <laughs> we're going to we're gonna trade it and it's going to get traded back and you're going to have to eat your yeah. own Sunday. There's a twist coming. There's a twist here. <laughs> and so we made a delicious, tasty, no spicy pepper infused Sunday. And sure enough, that was the trick, right? Where you did have to give it to someone else and then they gave it to someone else and then they gave it to someone else and then they gave it back to you. So eventually after all these trades, you ended up, you had to eat, you know, you had to have your cake and eat it too. And so <laughs> everybody else was so mad. <laughs> but in a game, you're probably not playing the game. Yep, yep, yep. Assuming you're, that, you know, that's probably not how it's going to happen, right? You're going to end up eating somebody else's spicy vanilla sundae. And so, yeah, it's just an interesting thing. Although maybe that's maybe there's another idea for folks out there to create a game where it's intentional, that you are really, and maybe that's the whole like, I cut, you choose idea, right? Where I'm going to cut something and then hopefully I get the thing that I want. But even if I don't, maybe I get something good. So I think, I guess ultimately you can do this. It's again, being intentional, leaning into it versus yep. just like, yeah. oh, um, because. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool stuff that, that comes out of loss aversion. So yeah, if you're all interested, um, like I said, I could talk about it for hours. So I don't know. How. Yeah, yeah. I'll put a link <laughs> to your book so people yeah. can find it. Um, but it's, there's a lot of really interesting stuff. I mean, even uh, is just the idea that if you, if you give, if you are gifted something, if somebody gives you something and like tells you it's yours and take care of it, that you value it more than something that's just like, you know, kind of random that you don't have, you know, just because you own it, you, you value it more than if you don't own it. Well, that's the Ikea effect, right? You value cheap, kind of mediocre furniture yeah. Yeah, because you built exactly. it. 
And so you have this connection to it. You want your players to have a connection with something. So, you know, if they're, if they're specifically kind of gifted, granted something, or they got to work a little bit for it there, it's going to be tougher for them to trade it away, which you need to kind of take into consideration. Sometimes the trading games It's like, you know, sometimes people get kind of stuck in that, that they don't want to trade or whatever. Um, or set it up like that. We were playing um, Railways of the World, maybe. I don't remember. But it was some train game. Um, and um, uh, you had to... Um, Railroad Tycoon. Sorry, Railroad Tycoon. The one based off the computer game. And you had to do... It's kind of a key part of the game is you're supposed to... You've got to... You can take out loans at any point. And in fact, you really have to take out loans, particularly early on, to get your engine going and cranking. And, you know, and then you pay them back. You have to pay them back by the end of the game. But, you know, it's very easy pretty much to pay them back uh, those early loans, you know, because you've, you've built a whole empire, you know, based on that. So it's, it's, but we played once with this friend of my daughter's, she was over and we played this game and she would not take a loan. She did not want to go into debt. She did not want to owe anything. She did not want that, the psychology of that hanging over her, her, her head. And so she had a miserable game just because she never really could get started because you need that money to kind of get going. So it's just interesting in terms of the way it was framed to the, you know, framed to her as, as a, a loan and negative, it's something like that. Whereas, um, you know, the rest of us kind of, we're, we're looking you know, further ahead and we're used to games like that. And we're, you know, we're, we're less attached to it, but you got to be cognizant of that. Uh, and uh, that's a whole other section in the book, actually, in a minute, it's like framing, um, is whether you're framing something as a gain or a loss. Uh, and there's ways to do it. There's ways to frame losses and gains and mm. ways to frame gains as, as losses, which is used all the time in marketing and stuff like that. Um, uh, but you can do it in your game too. You know, you can think about it. Um, just a real quick example of that, um, is, uh, in my game pick crew, um, you uh you're you're trying to get your race car back out on the track as quickly as possible and then you start racing around the track and moving it and when you're fixing it it's a real-time game so when you're getting your car ready to go you're playing cards on it super fast and you might make mistakes in fact sometimes you may want to make mistakes but if you make mistakes the idea was that you you want to finish your car fast because the sooner you get it going you then as soon as you get your car done you can start rolling a die and every time you roll a six you move a space on the on the the, the racetrack um, so the idea is if you get your car done, if you're get, like really stuck to try to get the right card that you need, you can just throw anything down there, get your car out fast and start rolling the die and you'll make up for it. And yeah, you'll have a penalty. And when, when everyone's car is done, the last team that finishes doesn't get to roll the die at all. But then you go back and check the cards and see who made mistakes and how bad the mistakes were. And the first time we did the game, it's designed to be like a family game, lightweight, midway kind of family game. We We played it and particularly with kids is they... Penalty points would move your car backwards on the racetrack. They did not like moving backwards on the racetrack. They would do everything they could possibly do when putting their car together to make sure they didn't get any penalty points, right? And that was not the game I wanted. I wanted people to, I, I wanted that as a decision point that you might, you know, take, a, take a, a small penalty just to keep going and do something else that was good. And uh, so I just played with it and tried to come up with something. And eventually I just changed it so that if you got a penalty point, if you got two penalty points, you didn't move backwards two spaces. Everybody else moved forward two spaces. Exact same thing. There was no finish line. It's just whoever was furthest on the track at the end of the game. So it's literally exactly the same thing. Kids were fine. No problem. Uh, they didn't care about the other cars moving ahead as long as they didn't move back. So that was an example where I was able to reframe something in a way that made it much more palatable for everybody that was playing at no real rules overhead or anything else. It was a, it was a stupid change, <laughs> silly change. Um, it actually requires a little more manipulation because now you got to move three cars instead of just moving one car. But in the end, everybody was happier with not having to move backwards. Yeah. I love that. Also, I was thinking about the loan game at Railroad Tycoon with the loans. I'm wondering as a designer, if you, if you could figure out, okay, players on average take out four loans, right around the first part of the game well in that case let's just go ahead and give everybody four loans they start the game with four loans yeah that's an excellent suggestion yeah. and, and then just a good rule in general feeling. is if there's something that your players always do like on turn one for the most part you're better off just baking that into a setup or something like that don't don't bother with them doing it start on turn two like go ahead and give them the resources that they always get for you know turn one like what are we doing we're just wasting 
time. Yeah. That can be like an introductory turn, right? Sometimes it can be good to get people into the flow of it without having to make super hard decisions. But in general, you're absolutely right. You just, just bake it in and just get on with your life. Yeah, definitely. Okay. The next one is one I don't know anything about. So I'm, I'm excited to learn about this one, the Caribbean cup. Tell me what, what that is or what that was. And then like how it applies to game design. So this goes back to our early discussion about sports. And, uh, you know, my, my obsession with, uh, with sports and sports related things. So there was a soccer tournament, uh, called the Caribbean cup. Um, and it was in the nineties, I'm going to say, yeah, 1994. So there's a game against Barbados and Grenada. And this was one of the qualifying rounds for those who are familiar with like the world cup or the way these things usually work is they break the teams up into groups. The groups play against each other, and then you know that goes it goes on from there. Um, uh, you know, who's ever the top ranked in each group advances to the to the next round. So this was set up like that, um, and it was um, the, they they got to this this round, and it was a game against between Barbados and Grenada. Okay, and the way that it the the tiebreaker rules worked. Okay, is that uh, Barbados needed to win the game, but they didn't just need to win the game. They needed to win the game by two goals in order to advance. If they only won the game by one goal, then they, um, uh, then they would not advance, uh, and Grenada would advance. So, you know, perfectly reasonable tiebreaker, you know, as go total goals, whatever. Um, but Somebody in their infinite wisdom decided that they were going to add a new rule into the game, into the game called the, the golden goal rule, which I guess this is again to make it really exciting. But the, in overtime, a lot of times in overtime, you know, they don't, it's a, it's not the first goal that wins the game. It's, 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 you know, in soccer, they'll play usually to the end of the period and they'll play a certain number of periods. If it's still tied, then they'll do a penalty kicks. Well, in this one, they decided they were going to try to amp up the excitement and they, made it so that the first goal that was scored in overtime uh, won the game, ended it immediately. But not only that, but it counted as two goals. Oh. <laughs> it counted as two goals in overtime if you if you scored it. Um, so some game designer off somewhere came up with this rule and said, this is cool. This with is no fun. play testing. <laughs> right. So the situation is that it's getting towards the end of the game. There's like three minutes left. Barbados is up by two. So they're in perfect position to win the game, to win, to win the game by two and go on to the next round. Unfortunately, with about three or four minutes left in the game, Grenada scores. So now Barbados is only ahead by one goal. So they try to score a goal, but they've only got like three minutes left to score a goal. So they try for like a minute and then... The coach like calls a timeout and shows people over and realizes what they what they need to do. See if you as a, as a master strategist can figure out what to do. Oh yeah, you got to score go, your own net, man. <laughs> they go back right, and they <laughs> score an own goal. Yep. So they score on their own goal to tie it up with the hopes that it'll go into over. It goes into overtime, and they and then they've got a full thirty minutes or whatever it was 20, 30 minutes to score the winning goal to go on. So they figure they have a much better chance in overtime of scoring a goal than in just the next three minutes or two minutes. So they score an own goal. Grenada is like super confused, but then rapidly somebody on Grenada realizes, oh, they want it to go in overtime so they can win by two. And Grenada realizes that if they can score in either net, they will go on to the next round. <laughs> because if they lose by one, they still uh -huh. advance. If they win by one, they advance. So they go out there. They start heading towards their own goal. Barbados realizes it at the same time. And Barbados starts defending both goals. <laughs> you can see the video of this. <laughs> All the players are totally confused. The fans are totally confused. Nobody knows what to do. Both goals are being defended. Grenada's just kicking it up and back. They can't get their act together to try to figure out which goal they want to score on. There's only two minutes left to figure it out. They don't. It ends up tied. It goes into overtime. Barbados, of course, scores the winning goal and goes on to the next round. There's videos of this match online. It is 
entertaining. It's also entertaining hearing the announcers try to figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> and the coach of Grenada was like completely livid at the end. He was like, you know, he was like, whoever designed this game was an idiot. <laughs> you know, it's like, and he's right. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, the rules can have such a huge influence on the game. And, you know, it, it's, it was interesting because, well, we, you know, uh, later, uh, right around that same time, the World Cup was going on. Well, when I, when I first kind of learned about this, the World Cup was going on. And I just happened to notice there was a, there was a thing going on where the U.S. and Germany were, um, there was some situation where it was going to be advantageous for the U.S. and Germany to play and end up in a tie or something. I, they, there was mm -hmm. something going on where if they kind of collaborated or Shake something, hands. that it would be yeah. better better for both teams. Or like I've seen situations in the World Cup where you want to face what you think is a weaker opponent because there was an upset, so you can deliberately lose a game, so you end up in the second spot instead of the first spot or something like that, right? And there's in the New York Times, there's a column called The Ethicist, Right. And the, the, um, just people sending questions. So somebody sent in a question and said, Hey, would it be ethical for the U S and Germany to just agree to, you know, just to play to a tie and not to try too hard. And the ethicist came back and he was unequivocal. He said, the point of soccer is you're trying to win the game. That is the, that is the point. And, you know, that's what people come to see. And that's, you know, and that is, you are subverting, you know, the, you're, you're perverting the game and, and by doing something like that. Now I, 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 I'm no ethicist, I guess, but I completely disagree with that. Right. Because what's the game, right? Winning the game is winning the world cup. Right. You know, that's the game. The game is not to just win this U S versus Germany game. The, the, the game is the overall tournament. And so often you see that these tournaments are structured in such a way that they create these perverse incentives for teams to underperform or whatever, or like the, the extreme example of the Caribbean cup that I just think it's so instructive for game designers to realize that that idea of an incentive, that's, that's the most powerful thing you've got. You're not, and you can never ever assume in any way that your players are going to play the game the way you meant it to be played. Right. Right. We have a saying in our family, we play a lot of games in our family, but we have a saying, which is you play the game you're given, not the game you want to play. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times, and, and so, you know, if somebody's, you know, it, if we're playing a family game or something and somebody finds a loophole and does it, you know, Hey, that's more power to them. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to talk them out of it. If they figured something out, that's on the game designer. That's not it. You got to play the game that's there. And, and sometimes that's the case. So you got to be really careful when you're incentivizing this stuff that you keep the players on the track that you want them to be on. If you want play to go a certain way, keep it that way, you know, make sure that that's, um, that that's going to work. And you always got to think about these edge cases. You always, you know, that's, that's what kills you is if somebody, what happens if somebody never draws a card? What has happens if somebody, you know, never takes this action? So, you know, you always got to think about that stuff of how people can undercut what you're trying to do and find these little loopholes. Um, so I, you know, there's, there's so many examples. There's been volleyball matches that have been screwed up. There's been tournaments. There's so many of these tournament setups that they need to hire professional game designers like us to get in there and actually design their tournament structures for them because it's not, it's not good. <laughs> Yeah, they, they don't they don't do it the right way. So right, that reminds um, me of a couple of stories. One, I was at a playtest night and I overheard this conversation at another table where the the game was over. The designer was getting feedback, and the designer like let's say he received some feedback feedback that he didn't like, and he said, "Well, that's because you were playing it wrong." It's like, well, hold on, hold on now. <laughs> No, no, you designed it wrong. Like that, don't blame the player. It's not the player's fault that they, you know, they saw something or didn't see something. Like you got to figure that out as the designer and don't blame your playtesters. But then on the other side, thinking about the potential weird oddities that can happen, right? So when I was in high school, my senior year playing football, with there, there were seven or eight teams in our division and the top four would go on to the playoffs. And the way the wins and losses, like everybody was tied. 
And so it had this weird breakdown of like, the, you know, the fourth or fifth tiebreaker was going to determine placement. And we went into the last game of the season, regular season, where if we lost, we were going to be fifth and out of, you know, no playoffs. If we won, we were going to be second in the division, second out of four. And so it was just like crazy, like how, like how coach, how is this possible? But, but it's because everybody was had the same, if, you know, if we lost, everybody's got the same record and we were going to be the odd ones out. But if we win, then all these other teams had to figure it out and they would be the odd ones out. And so be aware of that in your game. Like if you can, again, that's where playtesting comes in. Like you're probably going to have some strange things that can happen and just try to design out of those things. And I've seen other games, they just kind of say, you know, shake hands and play the game again. <laughs> <laughs> like they they couldn't figure out how to you know de- define a winner you know after the third tiebreaker or something like that and they're like ah, I don't know play again so I don't know, think and to think t- you know it's interesting just culturally uh, you know ties are so much more acceptable in Europe and really the rest of the oh, world yeah. than they are in the U S yeah not here we hate ties <laughs> <laughs> what, is it a, a ties like kissing your sister no yeah ties like kissing your sister is that the the saying yeah I should know that yep. being from Alabama and anyway <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and and. And this goes back to, you know, go all the way back what we talked about with design tools and probability and stuff like that. It's just that you can't, you know, you got to kind of look for that stuff. And you also can't leave in those low probability events mm-hmm. unless you're really, really careful about it. Because, I, you know, like we were, game I was doing recently, well, the Chang'a game I was mentioning, right? We had a exploding dice system. So you roll dice. And if you rolled a, there are two sides of the dice, you rolled them again, right? And then you kept adding results. Uh, which sometimes are good and sometimes are bad. And there was a thing where if you you tried to sail, I I like it because it's very open-ended. You can't guarantee, like you were talking about, you know, we were talking about you that you only had those 10 possibilities, you know what it is. There's no guarantees in that game. You know, things can go horribly wrong. And no matter how good you think you, you chances are of passing it, you could still fail. Well, there was one thing that we have, which was sailing, the sailing action. And when you sailed, you would roll to see if you failed, but as if you failed the sailing action to go to another place, for each one you were in excess of the the total number of cards that you had put in there before before you started rolling the dice, is you could um, you take a damage card, and the way the game worked most of the time you would take like one or two damage cards most right, but the way the game worked is you would, if you ever got twelve damage cards the fleet sank and you lost the game, well. I, I looked at it and it's like, I've never had failed by more than like two or three, you know, extra these explosions. But I sat down and I did the math and it was like a one in 10,000 chance to get like 12, to get up to 12 from the exploding dice or one in a hundred thousand or something like that. Right. It was really pretty tiny, but I plan on selling 10,000 copies of this game. Right. Right. And in each game, the players are going to take like 20 sailing actions. So now you've got 200,000 sailing actions that are being taken. And so the chances of a one in 100,000 chance hitting, it's going to hit two people out there that they're just going to all of a sudden just like lose the game because (laughs) of this streak of die rolls. And when you look at it like that, you talk about, you know, you don't want to give people a bad experience. You know, that's that's not odds that I'm willing to take. I mean, if I'm just sitting down and I'm saying, oh, I got a one in a hundred thousand chance of the game ending right now in this role, that's fine. I can live with that. That's, you know, that doesn't bother me. But when you look at it across the whole scope of, you know, the game becomes like really popular and a lot of people are buying it, there's some people that are going to get stabbed by that. So you got to you got to be cognizant of that, of even these low odds, black swan type events that they're, they're going to hit one of your poor customers, your poor players out there. And you don't, you don't want that. We changed it. So we actually changed it. So it was, it's, we, we gave people an, an out. So even if you were sailing, if your damage got super high, you could decide to like cancel the action and take a, a lesser penalty. Yeah. But even I was looking at even like one in a million, I could, you know, I changed some of the math. So it was one in a million, one in 2 million. And then I was like, hey, that I can probably live with. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing you've got to look at. You, you can't just brush those under the rug. Right. This reminds me, so you were talking about framing a minute ago with loss aversion. I, I really like games that allow me the opposite side. Like if I do this one in 100,000 chance thing, I automatically win. Like that's the thing. Oh, I'm going to go for that. 
Like, I know I'm never going to do it. <laughs> Me too, But on man. the off like, chance I'm that the I Hail do. I'm the Mary guy. If you put a rule in your game that if you can, you know, if you can roll six 12 times in a row, you will win. I will just sit there all day and try to do it. Exactly. Because I want the moment. <laughs> I want the story. The story to me is more important than the win or the loss, really. It's like, yeah, there is no way, but I did it. You know, <laughs> or, you know, or I didn't. Yep. And that's fine. Yeah. My absolute favorite mechanism for that is... Um, which I think is perhaps my favorite mechanism in all any game I've ever played is in the game Dune, mm. um, the original 1980 uh, Eon Dune. Um, there's the Bene Gesserit is, is a faction of space witches, seers, whatever, basically. Um, and at the beginning of the game, they write down who they think is going to win and on what turn they're going to win. So I think, you know, the Fre Fremen are going to win on turn five. Um and if that happens, they win instead of the person that won, wow. not in addition to, instead of. And it's, you know, it's usually, you almost always play with six players. So it's, you know, it's very rare, but when it happens, mm -hmm. oh my God, it's so <laughs> magical when you find it. And, you know, and also it just makes you super paranoid the whole time because you think, are they, and in the books, they're just very manipulative. That's, that's their big character is they're trying to move history in the direction they want. And so you're just playing, you're like, are they just letting me uh -huh. win now? Are they just setting it up to make it too easy for me to, it's just, yeah. it seems it's coming together really well here. I don't know. So it's, that's, that is my, absolutely my favorite role because it creates those moments that you're talking about. Yeah. I love that. And it's thematic. Like it makes sense in the, the story of the game. Yeah. That's what's so but beautiful. It only happens well. like once every 20, 30, mm -hmm. 40 games. Right. Yeah. So right. it's the feeling of like playing po <laughs> poker, like um, Texas Hold'em poker. And, you know, somebody flips over their pair of aces and they've got this full house or they've got some kind of thing that's like, OK, I'm the winner. And then you just like smile, slowly flip over <laughs> your your two cards. You're like, sorry, buddy, let me let me get those chips from you. <laughs> you know, it's that moment. Right. But it's but I love the Dune version because it, it again, it makes sense. It's not like random chance or like, no, it in the story, it fits into the gameplay, right? And so that's, oh, that's so cool. I would love to see more games kind of implement that in some way that it also kind of makes sense. That's that's a really cool idea. People are afraid to, to leave those kind of hard edges in there. People, people are afraid. Designers are afraid, you know, don't, don't be afraid to put in stuff that's only going to trigger once every 10, 20, 30, 40 games. You know, it doesn't have to all be there every yeah. time, so. Right, because like what we're, you and I have both agreed on, we are those players. Yep. Like we want to see that happen. We want to be the ones that, that do those things. And so give us, Give us that, even though we're a minority, probably, I assume there's not as many people like us as there are people who just want to win at all costs, like no matter what the W is all that matters, but the cool moments. And that's something I really like to design for and then play games that give me just the cool moment at the end. Maybe I win, maybe I lose, whatever, but the story I get to tell, that's what matters. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Shadows over Camelot is one that comes to mind being like that, where we were, we were playing a game. I think it's the last time I ever played this game because it was so like traumatizing. But anyway, we were playing it <laughs> with my wife's family and her grandmother, her sweet little old grandmother who like she plays games, but she's not a gamer or anything. But we were playing and she turned out to be the traitor at the end. And, you know, we were we we're all playing like we we're getting close to winning and like we're all you know getting excited and we can kind of see it like everything's playing out. We're like, oh, we're going to we're going to win this game. And then she takes the final catapult and she's like going to place it on the board. And we're like, no, 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 Granny, no, like, no, that'll that'll make us lose. And she said, I know, and put it down. <laughs> and she's Cold, like, Granny, yeah. Cold. And she smiled. And she's like, I win. Like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but that moment, you know, that's such a cool moment right there at yep. the end of the game. But give players that opportunity. It's such a cool, cool way to do it. But Jeff, man, this has been excellent. I've learned a lot. I know people listening have have, have learned a great deal as far as design theory goes. Closing thoughts. One of the main reasons I wanted to, to talk to you about this topic is one, to kind of put more light on it, just to say, hey, this is something designers, we, we just need to be aware of. You can dive deep into it. But also from the angle of, it's also a lot of fun. It's interesting. It's, it's not just math. It's not just algorithms and numbers. There's so many cool aspects to design theory and hopefully, you know, lighting a fire into people to go find find these things themselves, right? Because a lot of the stuff you're talking about are just kind of random things you saw in the news or you saw like an article or saw something on Reddit and you're like, oh, how does that play into board games? And then we're connecting dots through psychology, through math, through just human interaction and things like that. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to, 
to definitely do this episode, but give me some closing thoughts, kind of give some people encouragement as they, you know, kind of close out listening to this episode. Yeah. Game design. It's, it's a craft, you know, it's, it's something that can be learned. It's there's, there's definitely techniques that you can do. I mean, you know, if you look at like oil, like painting, right. People that, that, that want to paint there, there's a certain amount of creativity and spark that you need, but you also need the tools of like, how do I do perspective or how do I mix paints to get, you know, how does the color wheel work or whatever, you know, there, those things exist in the game design world and don't be afraid to, to seek those out and learn them. Um, but also to try to draw your own conclusions from playing games. I love dissecting games after I've played them. Um, or even just, you know, grab a stack of rule books and just read them. You know, I have a giant, I have a rotating stack of PDFs on my laptop for when I go on plane flights to, to kind of skim through rules and see how different people are approaching stuff. So, you know, just absorb stuff you can from anywhere. Uh, there's, there's so much good stuff out there. And, you know, like you're saying, Gabe, it's, it's so, it's not just like, you know, dry math probability, but it's, you know, it's psychology, it's art, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's so many, so many different elements that come into designing a game and you can, everyone can approach it in their own different way in terms of inspiration and stuff like that. I mean, I know like, um, for me, when I sit down, you know, and I start doing a game, I like writing a vision document and that's how yeah. I get started. And in my vision document, I put exactly what you were saying. It's like, what stories do I want my players to tell when they're a week later or two weeks later or a year later, right? That's, that's what I focus on. But I know other people that they, they've got a really cool mechanism that they want to start with and they build on that. And I know like Ryan Lockett, which really stuck with me because I just thought it was so peculiar, but it, it certainly has worked for him. who's designed um, uh, Above and Below and uh, Sleeping Gods and all kinds of fantastic games. First thing he does when he has a new game idea is he, drew, he does the cover artwork. He's, he's got an art background, so he draws the cover. And that serves as his touchstone for what he wants the game to be like and kind of how that's all the pieces are going to kind of fit together. So, you know, there, it's, it doesn't, I don't want it to sound like it's very technical, you know, like design theory, it comes from a lot of different aspects and you got to kind of tie into the one that speaks to you the most and use that to build out from. Yeah, absolutely. You're talking about memorable moments that shadows over Camelot story. I just told you was from 2014. That's nine years ago. It still takes up space in my brain. Nine, nine years later. I also have a Shadows Over Camelot story. The first time I ever taught that game, I, I, it was my my kids and two of their friends were over, the four of them. And I, I had never played it, but I wanted to teach. I wasn't going to play. I was just going to teach it and help them through it. But I deliberately did not put the traitor card in the deck. I like stacked mm. the deck. So I knew none of them were the traitor just because I, you know, just to make it a little easier for them. And okay. boy, they were all just accusing each other left <laughs> <laughs> they didn't trust each other and, we're, and i was just it was just so hilarious to me because i knew that none of them were the trainer they yeah. were just all so what was yeah. their reaction at the end when they found out that no i've never were the told trainer? them I, oh when they when they found out none of them yeah, were yeah. the trainer uh -huh. i i think they were just kind of angry at each other they just decided they were all just bad players exactly you're just bad at the game <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome also the fact that you'd like take rule books on, on trips to read like light reading, it gave me the idea, like, what does it look like to create a bathroom reader where we just put together like the most interesting rule book snippets that we can find? We take a hundred games and just like clip out the most interesting little sections of rules to just ponder, to think about and like analyze them, design theory, you know, there's a, there's a thought for you, but it, yeah, know, we don't, we don't already have that's enough. That's a very, on. now you're narrow casting. <laughs> <laughs> The rule book bathroom reader. <laughs> All seven people who are excited about that would buy it. They would buy multiple copies. There oh, you go. Man. Jeff, this has been excellent. Where can people find you? Do you have any games? I know you've got like 5th Eleven pinball games at this point you've done, which it's just, it's awesome how many of those <laughs> yeah, you keep coming uh, out with. My but. latest published series has been the Super Skill Pinball series. Um, so there's, and there's, there's, there's more on the way, but the most recent one was the Christmas one. Uh, the Star Trek one and the Christmas version were, uh, were, were both fun to do. Um, I've got, as mentioned uh, from GMT games, Chunga, which is spelled Z H E N G H E. Uh, they have this special P 500 program, which is like sort of their own inside crowdfunding program, but you don't actually get charged until the game is actually ready to ship. They just use it as a way of kind of gauging people who are interested enough to pledge even they don't, but they don't take the money until later. So you can check that out there. We got some previews and things for that. Um, and also we've got coming up in November, depending on when this airs, I guess this should still be time. Um, but right before BGG con, this will be our fourth time running tabletop network. Uh, 
which is a game design conference that's held um, in the Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, well, Sunday evening, it's mainly Monday and Tuesday, right before BGG Con in Dallas um, at the same hotel, same same facilities. Um, and then BGG Con starts on Wednesday. So we're having some fantastic guests this year. Um, we've got uh, Matt Leacock, Martin Wallace, Eric Lang, uh, a whole bunch of folks, um, designers that are going to be there. So you can come in. We've got panels. We've got group breakout sessions. That's really cool. So if you go look, if you Google Tabletop Network, um, you should be able to find your way uh, to that. Um, and then I'm on various social media, Blue Sky and Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. I've lost track. Um, and I'm at G Engelstein on just about everything. G-E-N-G-E-L-S-T-E-I-N. Awesome. Well, Jeff, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. And yeah, good luck with all the stuff I know you got work that you're working on that you can't even talk about. Like you got some cool stuff in the in the background too coming up here pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, I wish I got I got a, I got a lot of very exciting projects coming out soon. So uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, please stay tuned. I, it, it keeps me uh, keeps me interested. Awesome. Thanks again for your time. Thanks for having me.